So let's talk a little bit about how to interpret the coefficients of a generalized linear model. So the good news is that a lot of the same questions that you would ask if you're fitting a typical linear regression model are the same kind of questions that you would ask for a generalized linear model. So for example, we want to know whether the effect of predictor xj is important for the prediction or description of the response y. So in other words, uh, you might ask you might ask, you know, do we really even need this predictor this explanatory variable in our model? That's a very natural question that we would ask in GLMs as well as typical linear models. Assuming that it, do, it should be in the model, a very natural question is what type of association is there between our response and that predictor? So uh, we want to know whether the association, the association is positive or negative. Is it a linear relationship? Is it a quadratic relationship or some other relationship? So we want to identify how the variables seem to be related. And then lastly, even though I think this is kind of a, per, a fool's errand personally, um, you would in general like to know the magnitude of the effect of predictor j on the response variable y. And the reason I say this is a fool's errand is because the magnitude is going to change anytime you add a new predictor to your model to some extent. So I think it's really difficult to put an exact number on this, um, but you might be able to quantify or see whether the magnitude seems to be like it has a big effect or a small effect, something like that. Um, but I would say that probably these top two questions are the things you need to prioritize. So is a predictor variable, is an explanatory variable xj important for modeling our response variable? And if it is important, how are they associated? Is it a positive relationship, a negative relationship, or something else? So. How do we answer these questions? So perhaps the, the first one here is assessing the importance of an effect. And there's really two main approaches that you can do, that you can use to answer this question. Perhaps the simplest is simply to assess whether the center of your posterior distribution for your regression coefficient is far away from zero. Or maybe another way of saying this is if you constructed a, say, 95% central posterior interval, is this entire interval above zero or below zero, or is it largely positive or largely negative? We wanna know whether there's a high posterior probability that this effect is positive or negative, essentially. And if we have that, then this gives us, this gives us confidence that this predictor, this effect seems to be important in some way in describing our response variable. On a, more, on a broader level, we can use something like the widely applicable information criterion or the leave one out information criteria, which we've talked about this before, but essentially these are different information criteria that you can use to decide which model best fits the data from a set of candidate models. And essentially, if you fit, uh, the, if you fit a model and you identify this as the, the best model, then to some extent you think that those predictors, the predictors in that model are important for explaining the response. There are some nuances there because maybe that model fits terribly, that kind of thing. But assuming the model fits reasonably well, to some extent, we feel like we've identified the variables important or appropriate, appropriate for describing our response variable. So once we've decided what variables should be in the, the model, then naturally we want to know the type of association. So is a relationship typically positive, negative, or something else? And this is really just indicated by the sign of our posterior summaries for each regression coefficient. So I want to be careful here. So sometimes our posterior distributions have infinite support. So we can't say that the posterior distribution is entirely positive or entirely negative. But is the bulk of the posterior distribution positive? Is the bulk of the posterior distribution negative? These are the kind of things that we look at when we're trying to decide the type of association between a regression coefficient and our response variable. So in terms of assessing the magnitude of effect, I do have to say this definitely gets more complicated when you're trying to interpret GLMs. So uh, one thing that people will do is they will use first order differences or relative differences in the means. And sometimes we can have nice interpretations. So you're probably familiar with the interpretation for a normal error regression model, uh, where we look at, for example, the mean response when our predictor variable is equal to x plus one, we subtract, subtract from that the mean response when our predictor x is equal to x. And we do some mathematics and we get beta 1, our slope term. So this is assuming essentially a simple linear regression model here. And so then our interpretation is that, oh, beta 1 is the change in the mean response when our predictor variable x increases by one unit. 
And if we were in a multiple linear regression context, we would say after adjusting for the, uh, the effects of the other variables or something like that. So this particular example has a very nice interpretation. Another example where we have a nice interpretation where we're looking at a relative difference uh, is that you can show for a Poisson log linear model that if you have, uh, we're assuming like a simple log linear model, so there's only a single covariate uh, variable x, if x is equal to x plus 1 and you, and you compute the expected value of the response, assuming a log link for a Poisson distribution, then in fact, that will equal the mean response when x is equal to little x. Okay, so when we don't, when we haven't yet incremented the predictive variable x, multiplied by e to the beta 1 power. So in this case, what we would say is something like the mean response when x increases by one unit changes by a multiplicative factor of e to the beta one power. And in the context of a specific problem, we can give a much nicer interpretation. But for Poisson log linear models, we simply we usually interpret it in terms of multiplicative effects. If something like this is not available, which is actually frequently the case, sometimes people will try to assess the marginal effect of our predictor xj on a parameter of interest of your response. So in other words, it, it, and essentially what they do is they try to compute some sort of first derivative. I actually don't wanna talk a lot about this because I have not personally seen someone actually do this interpretation. But in effect, what you wanna do is you wanna take the derivative of the parameter function with respect to your predictor xj. And you'd have to look at how to do this in the context of a very specific model, which is one of the reasons I don't wanna do this. Uh, but this is this is a more difficult interpretation that would be really nice if, if you can do it. But people tend to avoid this kind of interpretation. So I'm just gonna kind of leave that there. A much more useful interpretation, especially for the complicated model, at least for me in my personal experience, is to provide the predicted means or the predicted mean response under the estimated model for several different scenarios. And so essentially what you do is you predict the response, the average response for different contexts uh, that you can imagine. So oftentimes what you'll do is you'll do a typical case response. And so what you do is something like use the average value or the median value of each of your explanatory variables. You plug that into your fitted model uh, or really the, your posterior distribution of your model. And you want to approximate the typical response in the typical situation. So this is, allows you to get an idea of what a typical case might look like. And then there are low profile cases and high profile cases. And you have to think about this, but essentially this is changing your explanatory, explanatory variables to be the most extreme values, either the smallest or largest values, to get the smallest predicted mean based on the data you actually observed. So for example, if the effect is negative, for a particular predictor, the low profile case would use the largest or most extreme value for that particular predictor variable, for that particular explanatory variable. If the effect was positive for a specific predictor, then you would plug in the minimum value of the predictor to get the low profile case. Alternatively, the high profile case attempts to get the largest predicted mean. So you choose your predictor, the you choose the extremes of your predictor variables so that your predicted mean is going to be as large as possible. So if the relationship between a predictor and the response is positive, you would plug in the, uh, the maximum value of that particular predictor into your posterior distribution. Similarly, if the effect was negative, you'd actually use the smallest value of that predictor variable and plug that into your posterior distribution. And so we'll see some specific examples of this as we do some examples of GLMs with different data sets. Um, but this kind of gives you the idea of what a typical case would look like and kind of the extreme cases to get an idea of how these responses impact. I'm sorry, the, uh, this gives you an idea of how to see how the different levels or different uh, extremes of our predictor variables impact our response distribution.